morning and good afternoon and welcome to the April 2023 WASD review webinar. My name is Andy Miller with DTN. I'll be your moderator today. And with me as always is Todd Holman, lead market analyst for DTN. Uh, a couple things to note during this event, all participants will be in listen only mode. Uh, we do encourage you to ask questions at any time during the event. To do this, click on the chat icon located at the bottom right of your screen. This will open a messaging panel where you can write and direct your question to the webinar panelists. Remember to direct your conversation to the, uh, excuse me, their question to the panelists when you enter it. I'll give you that option. Um, we will try to address all the questions at the end of the webinar. So we'll let Todd get through his, uh, his slides here. Um, and once we're done with that, we will have this uh, recorded event hosted on DTN.com within the next 48 hours. So those are the basics. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Todd. Thank you, Andy. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our April WASD update. We'll take a look at what USDA said in its monthly report of updating its supply and demand estimates. Probably the featured uh, highlight and expectation this year is what US, or this month, I should say, is what USDA will say about uh, the uh, crops in Argentina and Brazil. As you know, Argentina's had a very tough drought this year and uh, continues to have a difficult time with both their soybean corn and soybean crops, uh, while at the same time, Brazil is just getting started uh, with a new second corn crop, their Safrina corn crop, uh, which is their main production effort of the year. So let's go ahead and jump in and see what USDA said today. And as usual, we will start with the numbers for corn. So this is the U.S. balance sheet. Uh, that I bring up here and in the far right column are today's uh, newest updated numbers from USDA. And if we look at the red rectangle, we can see that the ending stocks total stayed unchanged today. 1.342 billion bushels still has a $6.60 uh, average farm price uh, expected on uh, the season. There were only two changes to speak of and both of them were really just minor tweaks. Uh, the first arrow shows that corn imports were reduced from 50 million to 40 million bushels. And offsetting that change, uh, we had a slight reduction in food, seed, and industrial demand, that coming down 10 million bushels to 6.68 uh, billion bushels. So at the end of the day, it was a wash, and we keep the ending stocks total unchanged. Now, this is uh, a little more than was expected because uh, just not that long ago, on March 31st, we had a uh, corn stocks report uh, for March 1st, and the total came in 79 million bushels less than expected. So the trade thought that would flow through uh, to this report today. It did not. The other expectation, I think, in this report, uh, pretty widespread, and I also shared the expectation was that USDA might reduce the export estimate uh, for corn, but as you can also see on that line, that also stayed unchanged, 1.85 billion bushels. So uh, USDA choosing to stand pat in today's report and save their updates for a later date. Now we'll go ahead and take at USDA's world estimates. And on the upper right corner, we see that there was a slight reduction in USDA's ending stocks estimate for world corn. It went from 296.5 down to 295.35 million metric tons. Uh, the metric I tend to look at is the ending stocks total excluding China. That also uh, was reduced slightly from 89.1 down to 88 million metric tons. And as we'll see in another slide here soon, that's just under 3.5 billion bushels uh, for the world total excluding China. That's the second lowest uh, supply situation for corn in 10 years uh, on the world scale. Uh, I wanted to point out the South American crop estimates. That's uh, part of the reason we came today to see what USDA would say there. And uh, so in that far left rectangle, we see that Argentina's crop estimate was reduced from 40 to 37 million metric tons. That's just exactly what the Dow Jones survey of analysts was expecting. Uh, in this report. That's the lowest corn crop in five years for Argentina. For Brazil, the estimate of the new, well, total production uh, of the season is 125 million metric tons uh, for Brazil. That stays the same from last month. There was uh, an expectation that that might have been 
uh, tweaked higher today, but USDA chose to keep it uh, unchanged. The thing I'll say about the situation in Brazil right now is overall the planting effort appears to have gone well, but uh, the uh, USDA noted that there are wet conditions in Paraná, which is at the toward the southern end uh, of Brazil, and because of those wet conditions, all of the corn may not get planted. They may shift uh, to a winter wheat crop uh, if if they feel that it gets uh, a little bit too risky to uh, plant too late. So there is some uh, slight risk of that Brazil production. Uh, being reduced this year, but there's no recognition of that uh, yet. Just uh, I mentioned that as an issue to watch. Uh, I also included Russia's uh, production in here. Now, we don't often look at Russia. They're not one of the largest producers of the world, but uh, they did show a bit of an increase, almost a 2 million metric ton increase in the corn production estimate for Russia. So I just thought that was a bit interesting, 15.83 million metric tons there. The last item to note before we leave this page, the export estimate in the lower right corner for Ukraine. Even though the production estimate was not changed for Ukraine, the export estimate was raised another 2 million metric tons. They're now up to 25.5 million metric tons. That's only 5% below last year's export total. In terms of corn, it's almost as if the, the war has not had an impact on limiting Ukraine's corn exports, which is, uh, in my mind, a quite amazing thing uh, to pull off that much movement uh, of corn in the conditions that they're in. So uh, we can see uh, a little more competition there than uh, certainly we expected earlier this year from Ukraine. As far as the world crop total, as I mentioned, I like to look at the world ending corn stocks excluding China partly because we don't have a lot of confidence in the numbers that come uh, from China, and that, that's the main reason. And we certainly don't agree with USDA's view that there's 8 billion bushels of corn surplus in China. That uh, just doesn't really jive with everything else uh, that we know about the market. So the latest estimate of those world crop supplies, 3.47 billion bushels. Uh, and as I said before, it's the second lowest total in 10 years. So uh, not um, it's 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 not as if uh, corn cannot be found, and we certainly had plenty of competition from Brazil this year, but uh, it it is more favorable for, uh, for prices uh, to see us at the lower end of the supply picture uh, in terms of the past ten years. Corn's fundamental estimate. Uh, I won't get into the all the detailed specifics of this, but basically, if we look at the uh, past 24 years, the price of corn, cash corn, that is, as a national average, the cost of production, and USDA's ending uh, stocks to use ratios, we uh, can come up with a, a very rough model to help us uh, understand where the corn price should be in terms of how it's traded historically uh, at these same uh, supply levels. So with USDA estimating a 9% ending stocks to use ratio, the historical model suggests that the national cash average should be close to $5.80 a bushel. Well, last night's DTN National Corn Index closed at $6.66, so uh, we're well above, almost 86 cents above uh, what the model suggests. So uh, I think the main point of this is not necessarily that corn is overpriced, but that the market has a more bullish view uh, of the situation than USDA's numbers suggest. And I think that's the important thing uh, to keep in mind here. Uh, one of the factors possibly likely helping support that bullish view is the fact that we still see the national corn basis at its strongest level in over 20 years. And this chart shows uh, the, the uh, thick red line is the national corn basis as we see it right now. Last night, as I said, the DTN corn index closed at $6.66. That's 12 cents above the May contract. For this time of year, we've never been uh, in this strong of a situation for the corn basis. So that suggests very strong domestic demand here at home in the country. And of course, we can see those higher corn bids in the Western Corn Belt. 
uh, where they had a tougher time raising uh, the crop last year. Uh, by the way, the corn index is up 25 cents uh, from a month ago. So those old crop prices are still staying very favorable. Uh, and I, and uh, again, I'll just uh, repeat that it, it appears quite obvious that the market has a more bullish view of the corn supply situation than what USDA shows in today's report. Corn exports have been the bearish part of demand for corn this year, and we still see corn exports dragging, even though we had a streak there of uh, about 12 days or so of, of uh, uh, strong exports to China mostly. Uh, but even after that little flurry that we've had, uh, the corn export total is still lagging behind a year ago. So the red line is this year's pace, the green shaded area is last year's pace, and the black line is the four-year average. So we're well below both the four-year average and last year's pace. Uh, as of the most recent report, corn exports, and this is actual shipments, were down 40% from this time a year ago. So we still have a lot of ground uh, to make up, and it's, it's, it, I think uh, it's going to be tough, obviously, to reach USDA's export estimate of 1.85 billion bushels. So that, that continues to be a, a possible uh, bearish adjustment in future reports. The uh, ethanol plant margin, just this past week, uh, we saw quite a jump in the value of what you can get from corn at an ethanol plant. And uh, so really ever since uh, early December, uh, we've seen pressure on ethanol prices and the other products that you uh, glean from processing corn, but um, that was trading basically under $8.50 a bushel. When you add up the, <coughs> excuse me, the ethanol value and the corn oil and the distiller grains, but just last, last week that value jumped to $9.09, and it was uh, mostly on uh, an increase in the ethanol prices. So it appears that uh, there's a little bit of uh, better demand just recently. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out with the driving season coming up. One concern for ethanol demand has been gasoline demand uh, is still dragging behind last year's uh, pace, and we're down roughly 4% uh, if we compare uh, the demand for gasoline compared to last year uh, since September. Pardon me one sec. Okay, thank you. Um, lastly, before we move on to soybeans, I just wanted to point out how the speculative situation was sitting in corn. As you can see on this chart of May corn, uh, we've been kind of a, a market chopping slightly lower lately. We had quite a sell-off in March, but we've rebounded uh, quite a bit of that move, but in the process, we've seen the long side of corn uh, cut back on positions quite a bit. And just a few weeks ago, we saw quite an increase in the number of specs willing to go short in corn. Well, uh, now that kind of coincided with the sell-off we had in March, but uh, ever since March 13, the markets rebounded higher, and we can see that some of those shorts uh, have covered their position. But the end result right now is that specs are net long in corn, just almost 86,000 contracts as of April 4. Compared to what uh, it's been the past year and a half, uh, this is a much smaller position. So actually the good news is they should have less, less influence uh, moving forward. Sorry about that. Getting a dry spot. Okay, now to move on to soybeans. <clears throat> the soybean U.S. balance sheet is pretty easy today. There were no changes made. We still have an ending stocks estimate of 210 million bushels and an average farm price of $14.30. <clears throat> The, uh, obviously, the production numbers stayed the same. The export total was unchanged, 2.015 billion bushels, and crush demand <laughs> remains unchanged at this time, 2.22 billion bushels. 
going to move on now to the uh, world chart. Uh, there was an expectation that uh, ending stocks would be a little lower today because we did see the March 1 soybean stocks come in lower uh, than expected. But just like corn, USDA chose to stand pat. Okay, on the world ending stock estimate for soybeans, we can look in the upper right corner and see that there was just a slight increase. Uh, soybean stocks uh, from USDA's view increased from roughly 100 million metric tons up to 100.3. Obviously, that's not a, a big change. It was slightly more than was expected in today's report, but I would say basically a neutral uh, adjustment there. The interesting part of the soybean balance sheet is the South American crop estimates today. <laughs> we see in Argentina the uh, rectangle on the left, the production estimate dropped from 33 to 27 million metric tons. That's lower than expected. That's also the lowest production Argentina has seen in 22 years. So they uh, obviously that soybean crop really got hit hard by this year's drought in Argentina. For Brazil, the soybean production estimate was increased slightly today from 153 to 154 million metric tons. Uh, that was somewhat uh, expected. There have been, uh, this is a kind of an after the fact adjustment. The harvest is almost over uh, in Brazil. I think it's 82% complete uh, as of late last week. Um, so that final total just being adjusted up slightly. And then in Paraguay, the estimate remains unchanged at 10 million metric tons. The last thing to note on this world balance sheet is the demand estimate for China, and that's on the bottom row. We see that USDA reduced China's soybean demand by 1 million metric tons down to 112.3 million metric tons, but they did not change China's import estimate. So they still think China will import 96 million metric tons but they do see a slight decrease in demand. In the text of the report, they noted that uh, crush activity in China has slowed, and we saw a bit of a, uh, some evidence of that earlier in March. So this is, uh, these two charts here are the prices of May soybeans and May soybean meal on the Dalian Exchange. And uh, just shortly into March, uh, the soybean prices started hitting new lows, and it wasn't long before meal followed uh, on its heels. So uh, I, as I've been writing about in our daily comments, something's happened to demand in China. We don't know exactly what um, possibly African swine fever is part of the problem here, possibly avian influenza. Uh, or a combination of both, but I thought it was interesting that China or USDA also uh, recognized a slowdown in demand uh, and uh, and chose to reduce the demand estimate by a million metric tons. This uh, this aspect, especially the sell-off in soybeans, uh, still remains a concern to me. Um, it's really the first significant sell-off we've seen in many many months, uh, and. China survived a lot of negative headlines last summer and last fall, uh, but uh, only when we got to the month of March did we actually see some kind of problem here in the soybean demand for China. So this will be interesting to see if uh, that demand heals up this summer uh, before they uh, come back to the U.S. for purchases in the fall. Uh, much like the corn model, uh, we have a evaluation model for soybeans and USDA's 4.8% ending stocks to use ratio suggests that the target price for soybeans should be $15.78. Well, last night's DTM National Soybean Index closed at $14.49. Uh, obviously, that's over a dollar below the target price. And uh, the, the takeaway that I get from that discrepancy is that I think the market is telling us that they seem comfortable that uh, the market will find a way to ration demand this summer and supplies probably won't draw as tight uh, as what USDA is describing here right now. Now that remains to be seen. That's just uh, my opinion uh, of the situation here, but uh, that's, that's what I'm 
taking from this. And of course, we've seen examples of that the last two years. We also had very tight supply situation in soybeans, but by the time we got to the summer, and, and especially after when you get past that May contract, uh, it just seems like uh, end users either found a way to get the supplies they need ahead of time so they didn't get pinched, or uh, they just found a way to cut back through the summer months. And it uh, appears that the market's probably anticipating that uh, here. If you've noticed, we've had a difficult time getting that cash price much above $15. And there's an, uh, another feature I'll talk about in a minute. When it comes to U.S. soybean exports, we're on a very good pace. Uh, we're up, the uh, actual exports are up 2% from a year ago in the latest report, which looked at the data as of March 30. Uh, right now, we have enough sales on the books that we're almost at USDA's export estimate. We just need another 119 million bushels before the end of August, and that'll give us a chance to ship uh, USDA's export estimate. So we'll, we'll see how it comes out, but right now the exports are a little ahead of pace. The basis in soybeans, not quite as strong and impressive as what we saw in uh, corn. It's not the strongest in 20 years but it is the second strongest in 10 years. And when we look at the uh, other uh, t so times of national soybean basis for this time of year, it's, uh, it's, it's in the, the uh, stronger category. So as I say, it's the second strongest in 10 years uh, with the soybean index at 1449 in last night's trade. Here's uh, one of the concerns that we've seen in the month of March, and that is that the, the crush value, the, the demand for soybean meal and soybean oil have both fallen off uh, fairly significantly here uh, in the month of March. The, the crush premium based on July futures contracts uh, was trading briefly up above $3 early in March, which is historically one of the best levels soybean processors have ever seen, but here uh, in last night, uh, that, that crush premium was around $2.29. Now, that's not the end of the world. That should still be a good situation for processors, but I think what we're finding is that the, the value of soybeans is now holding up stronger in relation to the soy products, and that does tend to be a form of uh, demand rationing that I think we started to see here in March. So there is anticipation supplies, soybean supplies will be tight this summer, but it looks like the market's going to try to adjust to it is I think the takeaway here. The speculative positions in soybeans, um, unlike corn, uh, we, we still have a very strong uh, speculative participation on the long side of soybeans. So this is a market that just based on the spec positions does have risk if there is some threat to, um, to basically to the price situation. And of course in March we had one dip down in prices. It rebounded fairly quickly. Now we're just hanging around that $15 mark and it seems to be that we're having kind of a tug of war uh, in this situation. But if prices were um, to fall again, uh, I, I, it would put pressure on the specs long in soybeans. So there is a bit of a risk uh, in that regard. On the other hand, fundamentally, when you don't have a lot of soybeans in the country, it's a, you know hard to expect a lot of downside risk. But the other part of this, of course, is that when soybeans sold off in March, it wasn't so much because of anything happening in soybeans as much as it was fears of bank failures and the gloomy outside market news uh, that was scaring traders. So at least this time around, that proved to be a temporary situation, but we'll have to see how it works out through the summer. Okay, let's take a look at what USDA said for wheat today. And on wheat, USDA did not stand pat on the ending stocks uh, estimate. It was actually increased from 568 to 598 million bushels. That's in the rectangle in the lower right corner. Uh, I also included the export estimate in that rectangle, and that stayed unchanged at 775 million bushels. The two demand items uh, that contributed to the higher ending stocks estimate 
we saw a 5 million bushel increase in wheat imports in this month's report, uh, something I think probably no one expected. And then the feed and residual category for wheat demand uh, was actually reduced by 25 million bushels. Now, that um, is a bit of a surprise when you think about uh, the southwestern plains, how they're having a hard time finding May, uh, or excuse me, finding hay, and uh, how corn prices were in the seven to eight dollar uh, range much of uh, last year and early this year, even still, uh, we see a lot of seven dollar corn prices. But in spite of all that, USDA is adjusting the feed demand by 25 million bushels here. So uh, that's uh, brought us up to 598 million bushels. That's uh, the lowest ending stocks in nine years. Before today's report, they were sitting at the lowest ending stocks in 15 years. So it changes uh, the, the perception of uh, the historical level somewhat. As far as the categories, uh, USDA made some adjustments to the ending stocks estimate of the different categories of wheat, and I thought it was a little bit interesting here. And the adjustments they made, basically, uh, my understanding is it's from uh, what they found in the March 1st wheat stocks report. So in the case of hard red winter wheat, that ending stocks estimate was reduced by 11 million bushels. In the case of hard red spring wheat, uh, that took one of the biggest increases. That was actually increased 31 million bushels to 151 uh, million bushels. In the case of soft red winter, that came down 14 million bushels. Uh, it's almost, uh, they're going every other one here. Uh, white wheat was increased 21 million bushels, and Durham was increased 4 million bushels. So uh, that, those are the internal changes to the wheat categories that made up today's 30 million bushel increase in the overall uh, ending stocks. And as I look at wheat prices right now, Kansas City's down 6, uh, Chicago's down 4, and the Minneapolis wheat is down eight and three quarters. So as we would expect, uh, Minneapolis has taken a little bit of the pressure uh, today from that higher ending stocks estimate. Of course, uh, the unique thing about today's report, or uh, thing we need to keep in mind is that these are all old crop estimates, and especially when it comes to wheat, traders are much more interested in the new crop outlook uh, uh, that we have uh, in front of us, and so that will become that report will be coming up on May 12th. But today's report is just the old crop uh, estimates. Now here's the world balance sheet for wheat, and we'll start in the upper right corner again and see that the ending stocks uh, estimate was reduced from 267.2 down to 265 and some change million metric tons. If we look at the wheat ending stocks. Apart from China, there was also a, a small reduction there from 127.6 down to 125.5 million metric tons. So some of the uh, notable changes here, there wasn't really uh, much change in the production category, except I did note there is a small reduction in uh, Argentina's um, production estimate. Instead of 12.9, they reduced it to a 12.55 million metric ton Crop. Now, that crop was harvested a long time ago, so this is kind of a late tweak. But the more interesting uh, uh, changes in the world estimates came in the export category. So if we look at the column uh, second from the right, we see that Argentina's export estimate was reduced by a million metric tons. For the European Union, their export estimate was reduced by two million metric tons. But the two winners this year and in this report, uh, once again, were Russia and Ukraine. Russia's export estimate increased one and a half million metric tons. Ukraine's export estimate for wheat increased one million metric tons. So it seemed like the, the Black Sea and Russia uh, have been more successful in selling their grain uh, this year, and uh, uh, the European Union was a bit disappointing. And um, uh, we've been talking in our daily market comments quite a bit about how prices from the Europe, wheat prices from the European Union 
just have not shown hardly any demand at all. They continue to just kind of slug around near their lowest levels uh, in a year. So that's been a bit, uh, quite a bearish disappointment for wheat prices in general this year. The last thing to point out, I want to point out under the domestic total use that uh, overall USDA increased its estimate of world wheat demand by almost 3 million metric tons up to 796 million metric tons. So uh, they, they do show a little more demand in total uh, this month, but uh, Russia and Ukraine have been the main beneficiaries. Uh, here's our chart of world ending wheat stocks um, from uh, uh, excluding China. And just to give a historical perspective, uh, the new estimate in today's report, 125.5 million metric tons. That's 4.61 billion bushels. That's the lowest in 14 years. So USDA continues to have a view of uh, world wheat stocks being uh, historically uh, much lower than normal uh, that we've seen uh, in several years past. But it certainly obviously has not uh, helped the wheat price this season. Fundamentally, uh, we have the same type of fundamental model here as I explained earlier for corn and soybeans. In the case of wheat, there's a lot more fluctuation and very variability uh, to this model. So take this estimate loosely. The correlation here is not extremely strong. But uh, going by this model, today's higher ending stocks estimate from USDA works out to an ending stocks to use ratio of 32%. When we look back at history, uh, at previous times when the USDA had that higher ending stocks to use ratio, it worked out to uh, $7.48 a bushel for cash wheat. Last night's DTN uh, index for HRW wheat closed at $8.43. So we're almost a dollar above the target, but I would say that there are good reasons, especially in the case of Kansas City wheat, where they're sitting in horrendous drought. Uh, for the market to be more bullish than this uh, fundamental view based on USDA estimates. The basis in wheat, um, I, I chose to show it a bit differently here today. I, bit, I uh, developed this similar to how I showed the corn and bean basis, and I wanted to show that the, the solid red line is this year's national basis. And uh, as of last night, we were 33 cents below the May contract. And that's actually near the levels that we were at in 2012 and 2013 when we had drought situation and tighter supplies. So it's, it's kind of in good company overall. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to show here, the dark blue line is last year's wheat basis. And of course, you see it plummeting sharply in, uh, in late February and early March, and that's obviously uh, a reaction to uh, the volatility that happened after Russia invaded uh, Ukraine. And it took a while to heal uh, from that uh, volatility, but by the time we got back to the May contract, that, that uh, basis level was normalizing. So I just uh, throw that in there to give us a little perspective about how the war has kind of knocked things out of kilter. But overall, this year's national basis is still among some of the better uh, seen for this time of year. The spec positions in Kansas City wheat, uh, it's been interesting. It's been a bit back and forth this year. There's been times when the specs have been short. In the latest report, they're slightly long, net long 3,000 contracts. Uh, we could call that a neutral position, but the one thing I wanted to point out was just a few weeks ago when uh, Kansas City wheat was threatening to trade under $8 a bushel, uh, the, the uh, specs uh, increased their short positions, but since that time the market has rallied uh, a bit higher uh, in that past three to four week period, and we're seeing those, the, the shorts starting to cover uh, from that situation. So. Uh, as kind of expected at the time, uh, th I think there was, it's fair to say there was an overreach when they were trying to trade below $8, and uh, we'll just have to see what lies ahead. But uh, it's, it's really going to depend a lot on the new crop situation uh, from this point. And of course, there's a lot of things uh, against the Kansas City wheat crop this year, and drought is 
is the main one. In conclusion, uh, no huge uh, changes in today's report. Nothing, I don't think, that was too shocking to the market. For corn, I'm calling this a neutral report, even though they, they kept the uh, ending stocks unchanged from a month ago. Uh, it was a slight surprise that they didn't lower them after that corn stocks report we saw for March 1. Uh, but uh, these are not big changes, and uh, there's obviously going to be more reports ahead of us and time for them to adjust. Uh, soybeans, I, I would also say this was a neutral report. I give it slightly bullish because, after all, 210 million bushels of ending stocks is a very tight situation, and it is the tightest we've seen uh, estimated in seven years. And then uh, lastly, the report for wheat was slightly bearish. Uh, got a little higher than expected ending stocks uh, total for wheat, uh, and even though that was moderated somewhat by a slightly a slight reduction in the world ending stocks uh, for wheat, it did uh, it did show a little higher total for the U.S. So that wraps up uh, in general the summary uh, for today's report. The next event I'll remind you is May 12, and that's going to be a lot of numbers, and uh, I'll. I'll be uh, struggling to keep up with that one to get ready in time, but uh, those new crop estimates will be on the way, and uh, there will be a lot of attention to see what USDA says about the new year. So, Andy, if you have questions, this is a great time. Yeah, Todd, we, we, we only have one, uh, and the question is, at what time will the Minnesota Grain Exchange futures reflect the extreme delay in spring wheat planting? That's a good question, um, and I, in my, I tend to say that oftentimes you have to hit traders between the eyes before they'll respond to something that we know in the country. Um, and of course, we saw an example of that last summer where we were getting all kinds of indications about drought and hot extreme temperatures in the Western Corn Belt, but it wasn't until later that uh, USDA came out with the report and, and acknowledge some of that, and then traders responded to that. We also saw it in 2019 where we had an extremely difficult wet planting situation, and it hung on in April, it hung on in May, and just every week that went by, we thought, you know, well, when are they gonna start responding to this? And then it seems like, you know, a week or two or three after you'd expect them, they finally do. So, um, this is where a lot of people believe in efficient markets. I'm not one of them. And uh, markets are human. And uh, I, I just think it is going to take some report or something. Maybe it'll be a crop progress report where we uh, finally show how delayed the, the planning is, or we show, you know, maybe more pictures of flooding on Twitter as the snow melts, but it's, it's going to take something to hit them between the eyes. And I, at this time, I just don't know exactly what that is. But uh, as you know, spring wheat acres, even if we could plant today, they're only estimated at 10.6 million. That's the smallest planting in over 50 years. But uh, of course, there's a lot of hurdles between now and getting that uh, planted. So we'll, uh, I, I wish, uh, I wish I could <laughs> have a little more predictive power with traders, but they are uh, emotional and uh, often unpredictable in that way. Good stuff. Well, that was it, just the one. So, um, okay. yeah, so that'll finish us up for the day. I just, I do want to thank everyone for joining. Uh, as a reminder, today's conference has been recorded and the rebroadcast link will be, rebroadcast link will be up on DTN.com within the next 48 hours. And Todd, as always, is gracious enough to put his contact information on the screen. So if you'd like to reach out to Todd, please do so. And that will do it. This concludes our event. And thanks to everyone for joining today. Have a great day. Thank you all.